So this is hopefully going to be a little bit of a lighter session after lunch. Um, it's not going to go into quite as much detail as everyone else's presentation has. I'll talk a little bit about some of the real world use cases of Zephyr and what my company has been, been doing with it. So I'm Alex. I work for an organization called the Arabada Initiative. Um, we're a nonprofit organization specializing in developing open source technologies for good. Um, we've helped partners all over the world build weird and wonderful things, ranging from uh, satellite trackers on the backs of turtles through to um, thermal traps tracking the arboreal movements of pangolins in the Cameroonian rainforest, through to uh, non invasive uh, active suction tags for manta rays and penguin colony monitoring uh, nest cameras in Antarctica. Um, our projects range from the craziest things you can possibly imagine in the craziest places. So this presentation uh, starts initially not talking about Zephyr. Uh, seagrass is not some sort of code name for a new, new feature or a new technology. Um, talk about seagrass, the marine plant. So seagrass is a marine flowering plant. Um, it can form underwater meadows. It's actually the only uh, flowering marine plant in the ocean. Um, they cover about 0.1% of the seafloor and store about 10% of the ocean's carbon. And they, they also produce a significant amount of oxygen as well. Um, they provide crucial habitats for marine species, particularly juvenile species that are um, developing and use it to hide out from predators. They stabilize the seafloor. Um, a lot of coastal islands um, have big seagrass meadows that are used to stabilize the coastlines. Um, it's quite important for erosion and other um, natural decay. And um, the sad thing is that seagrass is, is declining and um, we are losing a significant rate of it every year. And in the last 50 years, at least 29% of it seems to have disappeared. It's important for climate change and, my, and marine biodiversity that we actually look after it and sustain it. So this project, and I'll get into where Zephyr comes into it, um, brought us to the island of Bermuda. We worked with some local partners there to help them understand exactly what was going on with the seagrass. The, um, the government of Bermuda had been experiencing the seagrass decay over a number of years, and there had been some leading research that had made an assumption that it was actually green turtles that were eating the seagrass back to its roots. And while that's normally a good sign to see uh, high numbers of sea turtles or green turtles, it's actually something that should be kept in, in balance. The coexistence of seagrass and turtles should have balanced out the, uh, the idea that there were more turtles consuming seagrass than there should have been was an indicator that something was wrong. However, as the Bermudian government had gone ahead and tried to understand this problem, they'd planted these cages on top of some juvenile seagrass meadows with the intention of stopping the turtles eating it right back to its roots. And this seems to have done absolutely nothing. So they put a, put a call out for um, partners to help them understand exactly what was going on with the seagrass and, and how they could understand it. So this is where we come into it and, and how Arabada came to help the Bermudian government through the means of Zephyr to, to get to a solution for this problem. Um, what we discussed with the, with the government and local partners there was the development of a underwater camera that could monitor the decay of the seagrass, or at least the, ideally the growth of the seagrass, as well as monitor other variables to do with the water, temperature, um, pH, the light of the, uh, that's getting into the water. And the basis of this camera is built around Zephyr, which I'll get into talking about why Arabada likes Zephyr and how we use it for all of our projects. But we were, uh, we were approached with the initiative to produce a number of these cameras to place around the island, um, to place on the cages to understand what was happening, whether we were seeing turtles eating the seagrass or whether it was a case of something else was happening. We wanted to understand what exactly that was. So we built a generalized camera platform um, with, a, ooh, that gone? with the intention of using it for time-lapse footage and also for sensing. So this camera needed to be field configurable. We needed to be able to do things like set the RTC in the field, change the, the photo intervals, um, change the sampling rate for the, the sensors. We also needed it to be low power, able to last weeks underwater. These cameras were placed off, off the shore of the island, so you had to swim out to get to them. Um, they needed to be open source. That was a big uh, initiative of ours. It's, it's an Arabada theme. Well, everything we do, we try to give back. Uh, it's important for the world of conservation that these tools are made accessible for people to use. And we needed a hardened enclosure for it to, um, to actually survive these conditions. It's quite hostile being underwater. Seawater tries to destroy everything. So 
one of the important things that we do when we design hardware for our um, charitable partners, the universities, the governments we work with, is we try to use it as an opportunity to build a base platform that allows us to use one piece of uh, hardware for multiple projects. And this is, again, why Zephyr is really important for us. We only have a small team, so we like to use things like Adafruit's featherboards and their wings as a sort of standard form factor to be able to reproduce uh, hardware with different features. So this board here has got an ESP32 on it, but we frequently use NRF52s. Um, we have a couple of educational platforms using the RP2040. Uh, we like it because it's versatile and it's got a pin mapping that we know is just going to be always the same. We also use things like standard hardware connectors. Um, so Adafruit has a standard called Stemma, and I think Sparkfun uses Quick. They're the same thing. But basically, it's an I2C header that allows you to just plug a bunch of extensible sensors into each other. Um, one of our requirements was that the camera needed to be used by any microcontroller. So off-the-shelf cameras, uh, at least some of the ones that were supported by Zephyr when we were looking at this project initially, required uh, quite memory-intensive um, applications. So you needed big frame buffers to be able to handle all of the streaming footage. This is the reason why we picked this camera. This camera is um, a camera made by a company called Arducam. It's the mega platform, so it has its own internal frame buffer, and then you pull it over SPI to, to get your frames. Um, we need the camera to be inexpensive. So at the moment, there's 10 of these cameras deployed in Bermuda at this very moment, but we're hoping to be able to scale this at some point to be able to put more of them out there, and ideally in, in other locations. One of the things that this is designed to do is allow us to depopulate so we can take off components if we don't need them. Um, sensors, uh, the feather wing, you can even run it over USB if you don't want to have it battery powered. Again, this is supposed to be a tool for other people to take and use in their conservation projects. So this is a, a generic platform. Um, it's very simple. There's a couple of I2C buses that talk to the uh, RDC and to the sensors. Everything was done over I2C with the exception of our temperature sensor, which we went with a DS18B20 for the sake, that, for, the, for the reason being that it has an existing waterproof enclosure. Um, all of this, again, was made very easy by the fact that we had overlays in Zephyr to be able to quickly change these sensors out for different use cases. So here we've got uh, a Lux sensor for monitoring light, but we have other applications and we're already starting to use this camera again for monitoring pH and conductivity in the water. Um, our trade-off for designing a system that's modular like this is that we value the flexibility over the scalar volume for producing something like this. So having smaller uh, detachable sensors means that we can quickly pick things off the shelf to use, which is a common thing in conservation. There's not a lot of time. So all of our time is spent trying to solve the problem and not getting bogged down with trying to build the hardware. Again, we'll get into this up a bit and why that's powered by this uh, in a second. So why does Zephyr make sense for conservation? And this is a theme that we sort of discussed when we started looking at how could we uh, build for the future with the projects we were doing. We were doing a lot of projects historically, and a lot of them ended up with their own uh, repositories and their code bases that were all independent of the product project or the, the organization. So as we built new projects, we ended up having handfuls of different uh, sort of on the shelf, never to be used again projects. And this slowed us down. We only, we're only a small team. There's five of us working on engineering. And when we're having to rebuild everything from scratch every time, it was just a nightmare for us to keep up with the incoming requests from governments and nonprofits to help them build their, their uh, research projects. So Zephyr is powerful for us because it allowed us to pick a selection of ready-to-use SOCs. Um, as I said at the beginning, we, we quite frequently use ESP32s just for the sake of uh, they offer us a bunch of connectivity options and their low-power features are quite effective. Um, but we do have products that use things like the RP2040. We particularly like using that for education. We've got a couple of versions of our time-lapse camera that we use for schools. So we have, we have this design for kids to be able to go and write their own applications. And we have the Zephyr version of it, and we also have a MicroPython version, but I'll save that for the MicroPython Summit. Um, and we, we really like things like the, the easy-to-use APIs for power management, networking, and sensing. So this goes back to me talking about why it's important for us to do things quickly. So one of the things that we often do is we'll have part of the team write our drivers and the rest of the team will write our application layer. And being able to use APIs to split that means that half the team can spend their time working on the business logic of the application, talking to our customers and our clients to understand what they need to do. 
and then the rest of the team can build the drivers and focus on actually making sure that we're generating the data we expect to see. So one of the things that's really nice, and every time I go back to the, um, the, the upstream Zephyr repository, is that there's new sensors there. Um, a growing library of performance sensors for data collection is really important when we have people doing all sorts of crazy things. Uh, generally, this is driven by the community needing things. So often we have sensors that we want to use that we don't have access to, and then we spend our time writing our drivers. But it's been really awesome to see over the past few years that this library of existing drivers has just been growing and growing. And we also really like the tools um, for both runtime and build time configuration. So we use things like sensor shells, um, the I2C shell, um, the shell, shells generically just to configure the, the systems in the field. One of the things that's really valuable is being able to give a technician or an operator who's not a developer or not an engineer uh, a shell to configure a device. So you can connect over UART, plug it into a serial terminal and say, hey, run this command, set up your RTC, configure it for wherever you are, um, and there's no stipulation then about having to recompile firmware or go through a whole build tool. So some of the things we do with Zephyr that makes our life easier is we use a central board and overlay repository for new projects. As I mentioned, we, we have uh, a common theme in our projects about using the Adafruit feather boards. So we have a central board repository that houses our boards that we use. We have um, board uh, directories for the ESP32, the RP2040, the NRF52, and what it means is that our team can just pick something from there and get started. So if that's, that's a client request to have Bluetooth in it or to have Wi-Fi available, or perhaps it's, it's a requirement for it being super low power, you can just go to that repository and pick exactly what you want to start with, and you've got a base layer to start building your application on top of. We also do this for our overlays, so the, um, the time-lapse camera has its own overlay as well and some of our other projects we'll talk about in a little bit too. Um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the sensor API allows us to split development. So this also means we can do things like if we run it, we're running tight on time, we can outsource our drivers. We can ask um, contractors to come in and help us out, build our drivers while we focus on the application logic. This means that we can take a handful of things that we need to be deployed and get them deployed rather than having to get bogged down with writing our own drivers. We can get help with that. Um, we also like the, the SOC and sensor power management features. So this also goes back to being able to distribute the work. If we have a team that's working on optimizing for power, that doesn't mean that we have to have the team that's working on the application get too bogged down, but they can call the APIs to put the device into a low power mode. They can leverage the SOC power features as well as the sensor um, power features that are built into it. So the use of overlays also allows the team to extend to new hardware quickly. Um, it's a really nice way to almost have a hardware bill of materials by writing your overlays. You can see from a really quick um, overview what exactly the system needs to encompass and how everything connects. Obviously, Zephyr handles all the complexities of connecting the buses together and piecing our different peripherals. But using overlays allows our team to be able to really quickly throw together a new PCB that handles the camera or the RTC uh, and then very quickly attach that to the application. So one of the things that the driver um, concept with Zephyr allows us to do, and it's a little bit similar to Arduino with their comprehensive libraries of random sensors off the shelf, but in a much more standardized method, is that it allows us to create repositories where we can maintain just the drivers, pick what we need, add things that are unique to our applications, and then be able to grab them and reuse them. So we actually worked with, um, with Arducam to develop their driver for their mega camera. Um, I believe this is pending a pull request for upstream, but I think they're working on how they, uh, how they merge that. But one of our conversations with them was to help them understand why contributing back to Zephyr would be a really valuable contribution for them, not just to support the work that we're doing, but also to be able to put that in the hands of people doing things with you know, resource-constrained microcontrollers. Um, it's, again, it's a really nice way to be able to just grab a camera and get started with it because you just need to configure it as an overlay if the driver is already written, which is what we hope to enable for other conservation projects. As I said earlier, it's really important that these conservation tools are affordable. Uh, you often have sort of resource restricted university groups or charities who want to do work to understand their local environment, problems that are causing uh, concern for their local uh, wildlife or habitats. And the less time that we can spend 
getting bogged down by writing drivers and being able to leverage the hard work of the community means that we can get to solving these problems quicker. The more abstraction we have, the better it is for these teams to be able to build things. So we have a couple of tips and tricks that we've come across while doing field deployment. And field deployment is not the same as um, flashing your binaries and then handing over to somebody else. Field deployment for conservation work often means going to a healthcare center in the middle of the rural Ethiopia to allow a technician to be able to flash a device that lives on a roof because it needs a solar panel. Um, you might not be there to do it with your hands on, so you, you often need to be able to think about how exactly am I only gonna build my binaries and then get them to the field. This was one of the problems we had working on, um, on a healthcare project we did out in, in Ethiopia. So one thing that we found really useful was um, Zephyr's CI images, the Docker CI images for building and generating binaries. Um, as we develop our applications, we can test them in the cloud. We use GitHub and we use GitHub's um, actions to be able to test. What we can do then is we can version and push all of our builds through the CI and then point our technicians who are in the field, our operators, to go and grab these binaries rather than having to worry about tracking who's got them on a USB stick, where has that ended up, what version of code have they got. Um, it's a much easier mechanism because at least we know then that we can point people to, the, to the, uh, the head of the repository and they can get the latest code, not have to worry about what weird version they've got. Zephyr Shell is also fantastic, as I said earlier, um, being able to instantly give feedback to an operator to be able to say, has that thing actually uh, set? Has the RTC actually configured? Are my devices connected to a network? Am I seeing all the sensors that are supposed to be there? That's really powerful for us. We're not always there to be able to handhold someone who's using these systems. So the more we can give back to somebody without them having to get involved with menu config or going through a build tool, the easier it can be for them to actually deploy the system. So something else we've noticed as well is that um, certain microcontrollers and certain bootloaders make it a lot easier to do deployment. We found that UF2 bootloaders are much easier to use. Um, someone who's not technical has experience dragging and dropping a binary onto a USB device. Um, UART is okay. Getting a serial terminal up is uh, something that people can learn. Trying to open, um, open OCD and run through a build tool is not the easiest thing to explain to somebody, particularly when you don't have the internet. So some things that we've found that we've had to look out for um, when we've been working with Zephyr in the field. Um, not all vendor support is equal, it's a given. I mean, we've been very impressed in the last few years, the number of vendors who've jumped in on, on the Zephyr project, and it's been awesome to see so many people putting a lot of attention into the project. But it's often the case that if you want new hardware and you want to try new features, you're going to have to wait some time or contribute back. So one thing we ran into was, I think last year when we were starting to kick this project off, we really wanted to use the ESP32 S3. Um, we went through a load of development and then realized there was no power management features for it, which was a bit of a deal breaker for us. Um, so we ended up thankfully being able to transfer to another microcontroller, started some of the work to do um, that contribution back ourselves. Someone beat us to it, very small team. Unfortunately, we didn't get to contribute that one. Um, but the nice thing about Zephyr is that we could move to another platform quite easily. Similar to that, if you want an unusual feature, you will have to write it yourself. Um, we work with lots of strange peripherals. Um, one of them that comes to mind is a long range RFID reader. Um, we have these mounted on warehouses. I think there, was, there wasn't even uh, a C driver at the time. So we had to pull from their Python API and rewrite it. Um, not sure yet how we, open source, how we upstream that, but we have it open source. The learning curve is steep. Um, training a new team to use Zephyr is not the easiest, um, but once you get through the hurdles, all of these features that I've mentioned make it much, much faster for a team to start building new projects with Zephyr and not get bogged down by details. Um, manifesting consistencies, this has caught us out a couple of times, um, pulling in different drivers and different uh, libraries from places. You do need to keep track of things, especially when you've got lots of scaling out projects and lots of dependencies. Uh, we often find that whatever's pinned in your, in your uh, manifest doesn't necessarily agree with uh, what is in the manifest. Um, again, documentation is good, but if you want to use something that's unusual, we found that examples are limited. And again, this is something that just needs to be contributed back. So as we've built something, we try to document it and provide examples for how we've used it. 
So I think I'm running low on time, but I'll run through these quickly. Um, so we, we're using Zephyr at the moment in a couple of places. So we have our humanitarian aid tracking project out in Ethiopia. We've got a couple of feather wing development boards for using um, GNS and Argus satellite connectivity. We've got a dev version and a, an SMT version designed for going into avian bird tags. It's on the legs of birds. Um, and we've got a project that's about to go out shortly for monitoring seaweed out in uh, the Philippines. So what about the seagrass? Well, is that gonna play? We don't know yet, unfortunately. Um, so we have a number of cameras that are placed and deployed, and we're hoping to collect some of the data sets from them in the, uh, the next couple of months. Our hope is to take this back to um, the Darwin Fund, uh, the, the conservation fund that's, that's paying for the work, and get some more funding to deploy more cameras to hopefully understand more of the problem. But the research that's going to be undertaken from the footage we've collected and the sensor data that we've gathered should hopefully help the, uh, the scientists who are involved understand exactly what's been going on and, um, and draw some conclusions. And I could watch this footage for hours because there's so many great fish videos that we've got over the uh, <laughs> past few months. Thank you.